welcome. You're in the correct place. We'll be starting in a few moments. We'll just get people to be settled in. Um, there's been um, a lot of interest. People from all over the world joined us. Thanks again for being our advanced users and our early adopters. Hello and welcome to the special webinar. How are you, Michelle? I'm very good. We will be starting momentarily. Thank you so much for being part of this webinar. We'll be um, beginning shortly. We'll just giving users a couple of minutes to log in. Please tell us where you're from. If you've got that in the chat, then we can see that. That'd be great. Happy to be here with you, Michelle. Welcome, everybody. We'll just go on for a few more minutes now, just while people are uh, entering the room. You're in the right place. This is the IVF 2.0 advanced user session. Feel free to use the chat box to tell us where you're from. Again, thanks for joining. Here we are, Dakota, wow. North Dakota. We have people from Brazil. Welcome. There we go. You're in the right place. Hola, Arturo Carrete. <laughs> so, greetings from Nuevo León, Mexico. And we have people from Canada as well, from Toronto. This is the Advanced Users and Early Adopters webinar for IVF 2.0. That is excellent. Hello, James. Welcome from the UK. It's a bit late, but thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you so much for joining, even if it's late for you. So welcome. We will almost start. We'll uh, just some one more minute. I should say you're in the right place. We'll be starting soon. Please write where you're from. Um, we've got clinics from all over the world taking part in this, so that's great. Looking at user experience and looking at the early adopters. We'll be sharing top tips, and uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, next hour or so. So we have people from all over around the world, as we can see. Let's see, where are you guys from? Well, I think without further ado, we should, we should probably start, I think. Um, Hello and welcome. Thanks for this uh, session. We're joining um, us with the advanced users and early adopters um, of IVF 2.0 technology. Um, this webinar is powered by i3, which many of you may know for the um, monthly webinars that we have. We'd like to take this opportunity to um, look at user experience, um, invite people to tell their top tips and see a few of the practices which are going along around the world. Um, we encourage you to ask questions. We want to make this as interactive as we can, but please put your questions in the Q&A section uh, of the conference and not in the chat. If you put it in the chat, we know where you're from, but we want the questions to go in the Q&A section because we have people there who are going to collate the questions to ask the people there. Um, for starters, we have um, our co-moderators, two of the three co-founders. We've got Dr. Andrew Drakeley, who's Honorary Clinical Associate Professor at the University of Liverpool and consultant gynecologist at the Hewitt Fertility Centre in Liverpool. And Jacques Cohen, uh, who is the epicentre of all IVF innovations and chief scientific officer of IVF 2.0. And someone I'm sure you'll all know, the person you've probably um, dealt with, met, spoken to, are those first um, initial stages of implementing some of our technology. And that's Michelle Mina, head of client relations. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I'm so happy to be here and I'm thankful for all of you who are joining us in this webinar. I would like to introduce you to Je Janima Hamiche, uh, Debbie Monjon, uh, Marie Helen Godin from our example from, Can from Canada. Also, we have Dante Sanchez, Aleska Valadez from our test lab in Mexico. We have Adele Lim from Kuala Lumpur, who um, sadly can't he be here with us, but has sent us a great video. And together I'm joined by some of the talented team of IVF 2.0 to answer your questions like Omar Paredes, Mauricio Lopez, Manuel Martin Alcala, uh, Alejandro Chavez Badiola. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And, and finally, uh, it's my honor to introduce you also to uh, two of the founding engineers of IVF 2.0, uh, Professor Gerardo Mendizabal Ruiz, who uh, is a professor at the University of Guadalajara. He is the director there of the Laboratory of Computational Perception School of Engineering. And uh, Dr. Adolfo Flores Saif, who is a PhD in computational biology. Uh, these two engineers, mathematicians, these two people are instrumental, have been instrumental in the first stages of IVF 2.0 planning and executing ideas for AI in IVF lab. And they have both developed the Erica 
and SID platforms. Over to you, Andrew. Very good, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. So let's dive in with a few user experiences. We're trying to get this to be as interactive as possible. And as Giles says, please put your questions in the Q&A section. And then also there'll be time at the end for again, questions and answers. So our first speaker is Debbie Monchin from Fertilis in Canada. And Debbie's got a video to show for us. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'm the IVF Live Director of um, two labs in um, Canada, in Montreal area. And I'm happy to share um, the data that we got in our lab using T the seed, seed system. And this study that I'm going to talk about and the results that I'm going to share are from a study that is still ongoing. So it started in August 2022 when we got the system in our lab. So we thought that we might um, firstly assess and see how it works for us, uh, how SEED will help us in our daily basis. So we started in August 2022 and the results that I'm going to talk about are from August 2022 to November. And as the study is still going, we expect more results in the, in the very near future. So we started with um, 506 um, sibling M2 sites. So we decided to um, divide the cohorts into two. So the first part of your site, the 20, 249 uh, M2 oocyte were injected um, traditionally with the eyes, with the selection of sperm with the eye of the embryologist that um, performed the ICSI and the other, 257 mature oocyte were injected with sperm that was selected with seed system. All the sperm used in this um, study were prepared the same way using the microfluidic chamber. And then we looked at the lab outcome based on DNA consensus. And we also looked at the outcome based on the person who did the ICSI, whether it was a junior embryologist with less than five years experience or a senior embryologist to see whether seed would help um, one or the other at some point. And we, as we also have a um, time-lapse system in our lab, the s we did the annotation and we compared the uh, different morphokinetics of the embryos that are derived from oocyte injected with seed as compared to the other ones. So um, let's start with um, the global lab outcomes. So we looked at the fertilization rate, the cleavage rates, um, day two um, embryo development rate, the top quality uh, embryo development rate at day two, day three embryo development rate and the quality of this embryo, as well as blastocyst uh, development rate and the quality of blastocyst. So we've looked at all these outcomes and we didn't see um, statistical significance when we compared uh, ICSI done traditionally and ICSI done with the SIP system, but we actually see a trend towards better uh, outcomes when seed is used. When we look at the outcomes based on the person who did the ICSI, whether it was a senior or a junior embryologist, it's, it's exactly the same pattern. We look at, well, we looked at more uh, lab outcomes that are here on the graph, but I've put the most relevant ones. Uh, when you look at fertilization rates, when it's a junior embryologist, we are around 80 percent and 80 percent with seed and without seed and we do see a trend toward better results when we look at last assist development rate at day five when seed is used and this trend gets bigger when uh, when we uh, when it's a junior embryologist who did the ICSI although we don't reach the significance uh, we probably will actually as I told you the, the study is still ongoing so we might have some more excited results to share with you um, in the near future. So there's a trend towards better fertilization rate, better um, day three development rate, and veloblastocyst development rate at day five when seed is used uh, by a junior biologist. So as I told you, we also looked at the, all the, those morphokinetics parameters um, uh, of the embryos that are derived from the two groups of, uh, of oocytes. Uh, first of all, we looked at the, the, all these um, events that are related to fertilization, like the second polar body exclusion, cytoplasmic weight, the first um, PN appearance, the, first, the second PN appearance, the cytoplasmic halo, the PN fading, and the cytoplasmic halo disappearance. We didn't see any difference when we compared the two groups of um, oocytes. 
uh, we didn't find any difference either when we look at the timing of uh, division of the embryo from um, two cells to 10 cells embryo, the timings are quite similar uh, in the embryos that I derived from oocyte that were injected with sperm use, uh, selected with seed as compared to the other ones. It's exactly the same um, outcome that we see when we look at this, the timing of start compaction and of compaction and start blastulation happens quite at the same times uh, in the two groups of, um, of oocytes. And it's exactly the same um, uh, observation that we made when we uh, look at the embryonic cell cycle without uh, cis significant differences uh, between the two groups. So our conclusion there was that seed gives rise to similar biological outcome and embryo macrokinetics, which indicates that seed is effective in selected sperm, which is the good news. And um, we think that seed, seed will be very helpful with, uh, in the presence of less experienced lab and members. Uh, and we believe that if you only have like junior biologists, uh, they might benefit most the help of seed and uh, senior biologists, which will help them to select sperm as well as uh, senior biologists would do. And of course, um, seed uh, will be very helpful in standardizing sperm selection. So this is pretty it for today. And I'm happy to discuss with you more. Thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, so I have a question for you. Uh, so how would you uh, say uh, it's the overall user experience using seed? How was uh, for you uh, like to actually be able to get seed to run the sperms like using the interface like can you comment a little bit on that hi um i'm sorry i didn't i didn't understand your question it was um the audio is discontinuous on my side oh I, i'm sorry about that um my question is how, how if you can comment a little bit regarding the user experience using seed like uh, the way it's it, uh, uh, you, you put the needle to activate ranking and things like that. I, I don't know if you can hear me well. Oh, about the user uh, experience? Okay. Uh, yes. what, yeah, the, one of our um, curiosity point was whether seed would benefit most some of the people in the lab. So as we are junior and senior biologists in the lab, we decided to like uh, see what happens in um, in either uh, experienced person's hand. And from the preliminary result that we have, we believe that um, seed will help the junior embryologists a lot because we kind of reach the same fertilization rate when seed is used by a, by a, senior, uh, by a junior embryologist and it reaches approximately the same fertilization rate when a senior is used. So seed might help uh, in this, uh, on this point for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Great, great to know. So uh, we're gonna have time for more questions later, but right now I want to, do, to introduce to Dr. Adele Lin from Malaysia. And she has a very impressive results using PSO ICSI and she's gonna tell us about her seed experience. Thank you, Gils, and thank you uh, IVF 2.0 for inviting me to take part in this presentation. It is a pleasure for me to speak to you today uh, about our experiences in using SID or SEED for real-time sperm ranking during XD procedure. I'm Adele, I'm from Alpha IVF Women Specialist uh, in Malaysia. I have no potential conflict of interest relevant to the object of this talk, and I am not an AI specialist. All right, our IVF laboratory is a very unique uh, lab compared to any other clinical labs. Uh, we rely a lot on visual assessment to perform our daily procedures and making our clinical decisions. Uh, we use visual assessment to assess sperm during semen analysis. We use visual assessment to, uh, to perform ICSI, to check for fertilization, and also visual assessment to check for embryo development and also grading as well, as well as selecting the best embryo for transfer. Uh, because it is so different from uh, other clinical labs, it is important that we all acknowledge that this can be highly subjective. That's why we have embryologists that have many years of training and are experts in this field. 
But what we need to do is to ensure efficiency and consistency among all the embryologists and we can do things correctly and streamline existing processes. Today, I will share some of our experiences and outcome where we use real-time visual assessment tools to select sperm during ICSI. In June last year, we attempted a solution called SID or SEED uh, to assist our embryologists in selecting sperm uh, for ICSI. SEED is an AI that ranks sperm based on morphology, speed, and motility patterns in real time during XC. Um, we did a seeding study from June to December last year, where we subject half of the normal, uh, half of the oocyte for normal XC without assistance of seed, and another half of the oocyte uh, for XC with the assistance of seed. We had 89 patients in this study, and the mean oocyte age was 35.3 years old. The number of oocytes injected in the control group was uh, 536, and in the seed group was 514. We found no significant differences in the fertilization rate, abnormal fertilization rate, vascularization rate, and also processes usable rates. Although ICSI outcomes are comparable between the two groups, uh, seed show slight improvement in UPOID rates. However, this holds with rather low statistical significance. So in my opinion, SEED is an excellent training tool for junior embryologists. We can also improve efficiency and consistency among the experienced embryologists. And with SEED, we can also further streamline our existing processes. Our study shows a slight improvement in UPOD rates. However, a larger study is required. Um, artificial intelligence has been gaining traction in IVF. Uh, although selecting the best embryo for transfer is the most uh, critical factor for the success of IVF, it is also uh, a restricting factor or limiting factor if we do not have enough embryos or normal embryos for selection. So if we can increase the number of uh, fertilized eggs, we will then obtain more blastocysts and a higher chances of getting a U-boy. So in my opinion, seed may be considered as a tool to assist embryologists in selecting uh, better sperm during ICSI procedure to increase the chances of getting a new boy. So if AI is a tool that can work as an assistant, we should ask ourselves, do we need an assistant or not? Or who needs an assistant? Is uh, the decision has high impact on others or has high, has high impact on the clinical outcome? However, not everyone can gain access to very good assistant and that is very important. Uh, the quality of the assistant available is also very important to let us decide whether we want this assistant or not. Uh, and of course, how efficient is the assistant, meaning the cost and the benefit and how much time it's going to take on top of our daily routines and the cost to the patient as well. So I will end my talk with this. Uh, artificial intelligence will never replace an embryologist this task is only to assist us or to be a better professional. Thank you. Okay, uh, in our sleeping study, we actually use uh, Pyrozo XD. Uh, it's a, a, a new method of uh, compared to the conventional XC that um, most of the labs in the world are using. So uh, before we, we started using XC in 2013, so before that, our average fertilization rate was about uh, 68 to 70 percent. So after we started using Pyazo XC, our fertilization rate uh, increased uh, consistently more than 80 percent. So uh, Pyazo XC is a bit different from uh, the standard XC because it requires uh, additional tools and also uh, uh, additional training to the embryologist. So it usually would take around three to five months for an embryologist to master the piezo XC method. Uh, we actually do not change anything uh, while we are using SEED. So because SEED is only assisting us to select sperm. So uh, compared to the control group and also the testing group, we, uh, we do not change anything on the method, but only in uh, SEED helping us to select the sperm. Okay, at Alpha, we actually use AI at every stage. Um, we, uh, at the end of the cycle, uh, before they do an embryo transfer, we will actually talk to the patient and to, to 
uh, take consent of the embryo transfer and tell them which embryo that the embryologist is going to uh, select and why we select uh, this embryo. So in their report, uh, we, we will uh, give them the AI score and from there, we will explain what is AI to them. Well, thank you very much, Dal Lim. And the pity you can't join us, of course, for you, it's about three o'clock in the morning. So we understand uh, there, are, there are questions and this was a great talk. Thank you so much. There are questions. Um, and uh, I hope that somebody from the panel here um, uh, will come forward and, and answer a question for for Adele. Um, I, I would ask a question, uh, Jack, maybe for yourself or for what, you know, Giles or any of the scientists. How common is it to do piezo uh, ICSI around the world? I know it's not that common in the UK, certainly. I don't know about colleagues in, in Canada, for example, Mary Helen, or is it quite common or to do that there? Oh, sorry. No, it's definitely not a common technique that, that we use. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same in the United States. It's uh, it's certainly something uh, people are interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the mo I think one of the most important reasons to use it is that when you when you go with these sharp needles through the zona pellucida, you actually find that they're not that sharp and that uh, you get this tremendous indentation in this elastic um, 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 Zona pellucida, most of these zona pellucida are very, very elastic. And so you get an indentation that puts pressure on the membrane. And then when the, the needle finally goes through, if people don't separate the membrane from the zona pellucida and don't wait a few seconds for the zona pellucida to kind of pop back, then you, you can have that risk of breaking the membrane. And we know that if you break the membrane at that point, very early, before, when you go into the oocyte, right at that point, that you have a slightly higher degeneration rate. So that's where Piazzo comes in. You can see that in the video that Adele showed, that it's very, very fine-tuned. And you get a very, very nice piercing of the zona without, without, um, 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 without making that indentation that you normally have when you use a, a typical ICSI needle. That's the major, major advantage. On the membrane, the advantage is there too, at least in the example that she showed, but often piazza on the membrane has less of an effect uh, compared to the regular needles that I use. So, so there is an advantage, but of course, there are ways of doing that. In the, you know, some people in the past have used lasers, there are actually quite a few, few uh, um, papers, even, even I think a meta-analysis on using laser to make the needle go through the zona pellucida. It's, that's sort of the same principle as using a piazza, but there is some, some advantages of piazza, particularly in animal science. So that's a length, lengthy answer. Uh, so, so maybe I can take it, uh, can take it to, uh, to introduce the, um, um, you know, the next, the next speakers and we're going to look at, uh, so thank you again, uh, uh, Adele, uh, maybe next time you can join us live. Uh, the next, the next uh, uh, experiences from, uh, from our own labs, the Mexican experience in Guadalajara. This is in New Hope, Guadalajara. And uh, the talk will be presented by the lab manager, Alaska Valaldes, and, uh, and also the senior embryologist, Dante Sanchez. Yeah, so hi, I'm the embryologist at New Hope Fertility Center, Guadalajara. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about our experience using uh, the artificial intelligence uh, here in Guadalajara and also in Mexico City. So uh, I'm going to start first talking a little bit about Erika and Sid. i uh, just like to do like a little recap. Okay, so um, Erika ranks accordingly to employee probability, also assists us as embryologists to choose the best embryo to transfer, and well, that reduces the time to achieve the pregnancy. Okay? And with Sid, well, it's a real-time sperm selection. It ranks based on motility and progression. It also improves blastocyst rate by assisting the sperm selection. So I'm just talking a little bit about Erika. I'm gonna talk a little bit of uh, the work we have done. We, we've been working with Erika since 2019 and we have been evaluating 1,067 uh, cycles. Okay. And we did, uh, based on the results that we have obtained, some papers have been published and New Hope was present at the ASRM and in the Mexican version that it's called the AMMR, that it's uh, the Mexican Association of the Reproductive Medicine. Okay, so in these two Congress, we uh, presented some posters. 
This right here is the poster we presented, presented about Erika. Um, we evaluated the performance of Erika by selecting embryos according to their score. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, like, the inclusion criteria was that the patient had more than one embryo to transfer and that they didn't have another uh, selection criteria like PGT or anything else. Okay. And so in this, um, in this poster, we concluded that the order of the embryo in Erika's ranking does impact the outcome of the transfer. So Erika's assistant could become an advantage in choosing the best embryo for transfer, so reducing the time for a pregnancy. And the poster that uh, we presented about Sid, it's, uh, we presented in, in the last year, and we've been using Sid since 2021. So um, we have been recording uh, around 500 ICSIN, ICSIS using Sid. And um, our poster about Sid. Uh, was about a sibling study where we evaluated the impact of the sperm selection using SID. In this one, the inclusion criteria was that the patient had to be between 18 and 40 years old, that the ICSI had to be reported, and um, this one was very specific, that the ICSI dish, where you were going to do the ICSI, <laughs> was, uh, had a drop of PVP that was at 7%. Okay. So, um, oh, sorry. Um, um, the exclusion criteria for this one is that uh, the sample didn't come from a testicular biopsy and that there weren't more than 15 oocytes. So uh, the conclusion from this poster was that uh, the use of seed does increase the probability of a normal fertilization, as Debbie also said, and also the impact of seed on blastocyst formation shows a positive trend Although there wasn't like enough samples for us to uh, to say that it has a, a, a statistical significance, but I'm going to talk to you about more uh, our experience on how do we do it, how do we work with both of them, Erika and Z. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about Erika. Okay, so Erika really is super easy to use. So I put these four points, uh, that it's the four points that we do on a daily basis. Okay, so um, for example, if you want to, um, well, I'm going to start like, for example, us in the, in the first thing in the morning, we take out the embryos out of the incubator and we take photos of them. So uh, we see how many embryos are we going to vitrify and how um, in the stage that they are in, in that moment. We put them back in the incubator, then we take out everything, the media that we're going to use, the cortex, everything. And then, um, we take them back again out of the incubator and we take a photo again. Because from the first photo to the second photo, I don't know, it has passed like around two hours. So the embryo has grown. So we take another picture and that last picture is the one we're going to upload to Erica because it's the most similar to the, um, to the stage that we vitrify the embryo. So we're gonna upload that one and we're gonna rank it with, with Erica. So that's like, the process that we do. For example, if we have a transference, that is a uh, fresh transference, in the early morning, we take the picture of the embryo and then we upload it at, in that moment so we can have the result by the time the transference is going to, to take place. And also, for example, if you have um, an embryo that you're going to do biopsy, we upload the photo of the embryo after the biopsy because maybe at the first the embryo is uh, super big, it's hatching and everything, but then after the, the biopsy, maybe it's a little bit smaller. So we always use the one that is after the, the biopsy because it's the most uh, accurate to the embryo. Okay. Uh, so uh, the third point, it's something that we do and I wanted to share, it's just like a tip. <laughs> so, um, we upload the cycle of the patient as soon as we have the photos. For example, we concluded one uh, cycle, we upload it to Erica. We do this just to um, let the doctors know the results so we can all um, decide which one is the one that uh, we are going to transfer. And uh, the last point, I don't know if you know about this, but uh, maybe you do, if you don't. <laughs> 
Uh, Erika lets you compare the cycles. For example, you have one patient that has three cycles. In, in the three cycles, she has two embryos per cycle. Okay? So you can compare them all together, and Erika is going to rank them all. So you can choose um, the, the best embryo between the three cycles. Then talking about seed, okay? Uh, here uh, in this side, I put in an ICSI dish. This is the ICSI dish that we use to, to make the ICSI, obviously. <laughs> so I'm just gonna uh, explain like this drop, the square that is at the bottom, at the top, sorry, on the left. This is the, uh, it's a drop, it's like a square kind of, of multipurpose or HDF, the media you use, it doesn't um, really matter. Here are two lines of PVP. Uh, you can put as much as lines as you want. Maybe you can, maybe you just want to put one. Here are two of the drops that we use to wash the oocytes. And then these ones are the ones that we're gonna use to put the, the oocytes to do the ICSI. Okay. So uh, what we do, and it's like a tip if you wanna try it. What we do is we put the sperms in this square. Okay. Then we take the whole, um, dish and we put it on the ICSI, uh, well in the microscope, sorry. And then uh, with the ICSI pipette, we're going to go to this drop and we're going to take some sperms and we're going to pass them to the PVP um, lines. Okay, We do this uh, because uh, this way we avoid having too many sperms and then it makes it uh, a little bit difficult to visualize the ones we want. So by doing, uh, by grabbing some sperm Sperms from here, we grab around like 20 maybe, and then pass them here. And then in here, we rank them with seed. So it lets you like uh, focus on the, on the ones that seed um, is selecting. You don't have like too many sperms in your, in your line. Okay, so now uh, seeds rank them. And here comes the other tip that I'm gonna give you. You do the ranking, and I don't know if you uh, can see, but here are the three, uh, the three um, circles of the ranking of, of seed, right? So let's say that I want to go for this one. So what I do is I put the pipette near the sperm that I'm gonna go, and then I look at the microscope and I immobilize it. Okay? That's like the easiest way for me to do it. There's also some uh, persons that have told me that they use, uh, they put the pipette in the center, the ranking starts, and they immobilize it watching the, the computer. But uh, I haven't tried it. I like my way of uh, immobil putting the pipette near, near the sperm and then watching it in the, in the microscope. Okay. So, um, well, that's like the tips I can give you um, from seed. It's actually very easy to put the pipette in the middle of the of the um, of the. Of the sorry, screen. I forgot the name. Yeah, screen. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's really easy to put it in the middle of the screen. So, so to start the the ranking. So that's about it. And well, about our experiences, uh, the results the results have been very successful. Um, we've had very good results with Erika and also with Sid. We also saw that the, uh, Sid is a great training to tools for junior embryologists. It helps them to be more secure about their decision. And we also can leave the subjectivity aside, okay? And, uh, and a lot of this translates into reducing the time to meet the goal of having a baby at home. And well, we also must remember that these are tools, okay? So they are going to help us but sometimes you might not agree with Erica or Sid, and that's totally okay. I mean, it's a tool, it's supposed to help you, but if in that moment you decide to do um, to go other way, that's okay. Um, just to remember, well, you have the, the last decision. That will be all. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for your presentation, Alex. I really liked it. I thought it was brilliant sharing you, you sharing top tips on how embryologists use the technology. Now, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Number one would be, how does Erica and Sid fit into your daily job? And what's it like to be a testing lab? Okay, so um, Erica and Sid help us to make better decisions in choosing the best embryo to transfer and the best sperm to perform ICSI. Uh, so with these tools, we remove the subjectivity in decision-making process of the two most important steps in the day-to-day -day procedures. 
And uh, we are also excited to be among the first to use this software because we're being part of innovation and well, we are, we are delivering good results. Okay, perfect. Now, my second and last question would be, have you noticed any difference in the ICSI processing time, like using ICSI normally versus using SID and ICSI? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's just a matter of getting used to the, uh, to using the software, but it, it facilitates the process of selecting the sperm and also, well, it suggests the best sperm, so it you know, yeah, makes the choice uh, of the sperm really quick. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for your answers. Now, um, we will move on towards the next speaker. We have Omar Paredes. He's head of research of IBF 2.0. So, Omar, take it away. Uh, thanks, Mr. Presentation. Uh, I, I, as, as you mentioned, I'm the head of research for IBF. So, I'm going to present you uh, about how uh, EIs and can help us in the in the way to of analyzing and find the sweet the, the the suitable sperm. So it, for this case, I'm going to to talk about what is going on with the AI, how, what is going on about how to improve our our technologies, how to improve the way we select. Something that we don't have to forget is that what we are going or we are doing with this stuff is trying to play in the, 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 a, detective role, a, a detective role. In this case, we're trying to, to see an image, to see a, a video, to see anything and try to find out if we can, about this information, retrieve anything about the suitable one. So for example, it's something similar that, okay, see this, uh, this sperm, is this suitable to, uh, to use in the, in the procedure or not? Or maybe we can move on and see, okay, we have another one. And then we can move on and say, okay, this is another one. If, if you see, we have these different images because we have different assets, we have different uh, knowledge about it. So the, the subjectivity that is uh, around all this selection, it's kind of great. It's, 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 it's uh, bigger. So in this case, we are actually playing a flip. A flip with a coin. Why? Why is that? Because uh, if we if we see about the statistic about how to sele select the, the 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 adequate sperm, we have this uh, statistic saying that the ex even experienced andrologists only select about fifty percent of the time normal sperms. So we are trying to to select sperms that even though is uh, an abnormal one. So if we have a flip how can we assure that we are actually seeing or watching the same? We are like playing this metaphor story about uh, blind guys trying to, 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 to describe what are they touching and they're touching the same object, but they are feeling, seeing, and even have the experience of different stuff. So in this, in, in this case, what do we have to do about it? Okay. So. What I, I see or what I suggest is that we have to find the missing pieces. What are the missing pieces? The misses, the missing pieces about this is that we are looking the same stuff, but all the stuff have different perspective because we have different perspective from experience from us or laboratory assets and all the stuff. So why what are we going to do perspectives or regarding this? What we have to do is in covering the hidden insight. What we need to do is uh, technology helping us about, okay, we have this video, this recording, or we have this the image and try to see if they can help us to select the adequate one once we have it in the in the, in the the screen. Okay, for example, we have, and we know that this is the, the adequate one. So how we integrate the idea of selecting the suitable one, we have to see, take a time to our decision and then say, okay, this is the one that I am going to transfer to, that, that we are going to use in the, in the procedure. Okay, the AI takeover or the, 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 AI, the AI is helping, helping us about any uh, different stuff. I remember, for example, about AlphaGo. AlphaGo was this technology that tried to play the hardest board game in the world that is called Go. I remember when I was in studying my PhD that they released this this new AlphaGo beat the World Championship. Why was that, or what? How uh, 
artificial intelligence can achieve something that before that it was impossible to imagine. Okay, so they they say that, that the, actually AlphaGo was the first computer to to defeat a Go player, even though that it was the uh, the, and the strongest player in the history, the the championship. So actually, that's it's not the only case where AIs take this advantage because I remember also doing my PhD that I had this new. One of the biggest mysteries of biology is was solved. I remember when we had the new that we have a uh, uh, artificial intelligence that can fold a protein that can uh, actually say how is the form that a, a protein is having or showing only with a sequence. So we have this technology that fold protein structures and that can help us to accurately uh, predict the structure and enable us to 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 uh, fold all the proteome of the hu the human proteome. Yeah. So what's next? We have this. This this icon is the icon for a technology or AI called ChatGTP. ChatGTP uh, was released in November, and it, it was a chat that you can speak of and try to to and and there was like a confusion if you are talking with a person or we are chatting with the AI. So in this case, we have reached the million users in just two months. Something that Instagram or other social networks can reach. So it was transforming the way how we conceive the world of the AIs. So how to took all this AI technology and try to innovate about the sperm, okay? We have to look about features that are moving, that are trying to, to, to describe what we see. And then, okay, we try to see the motility. We try to see maybe the, the morphology on even though something more hard to, to analyze with image that are the DNA integrity. They are the three stuff or cornerstone, cornerstone of what we need to look if we want to choose the suitable sperm. What are we doing right now? Okay, AIs help us already to uh, choose based on motility. So how can we move to try to solve the other two cornerstones of the selections. We have to uh, do an AI-driven analysis about, okay, I have this image, and this image is something built of uh, microscopy 2D. So we have to build maybe a 3D analyst, uh, images or, or body. Then try to segment the parts that would be important to track off and to see if there are the adequate morphology. Then we try to relate them. We try to see what are the uh, relationship between each of the parts we are saying are the important ones. Then we need to uh, try to build a relationship network about all this part and then decide. Decide with the help of the AIs. Uh, all this stuff is going to, to bridge the gap between experienced embryologists, andrologists, and junior clean efficiencies, yeah? So what's the, the the frontier about this? The frontier is that we want to see how they move, how they are in the 3D construction of a, two, uh, a couple of 2D images, yeah? And how this movement, how this 3D reconstruction will help us and, and are going to help us with the selection of the intelligence sperm, how we are going to say it. Yeah. Uh, what's next? Okay. What is going to to going on about this? That let's remember we have to find pictures from to find features and then from data have to discover that the sperm that is going to give us the outcome we we want. That is a pregnancy. Yeah. So before finish this presentation, I want to thank Anolage, the AIs that helping me to 
build this presentation. I use ChatGTP to outline the talk, the, 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 the slides. I use Crayon and Dali to generate the image I use in this presentation. I use Dali to put all to help me to generate the GIF I use this. So let's see that I build this presentation using AIs. So if I use or combine the analytical capabilities of AI with the understanding of us, the experts, we can achieve breakthrough uh, discoveries that once again was thinking was impossible. Yeah. So there we don't be, need to be afraid of AIs. We need to embrace them and use them to achieve better results. Thanks. Thanks, Omar. That was a great talk. Um, in the studies you've been doing, have you found a strong correlation between the motility patterns and morphology? Yeah, we, we, we are. Uh, we are working on that, and we see that there are a correlation between how the, the maybe the head and the mid, mid, uh, mid the nook of the sperm are correlated with the way they swim. So uh, actually, yeah, we we have a, a difference between normal and abnormal uh, sperms. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, and obviously Omar will stay for the Q and A at the end. So now I've got um, a great pleasure to introduce our co-founder and friend. Dr. Alejandro Fadiola on his vision for the future and how to introduce AI into your lab. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. And I'm going to present to you IVF 2.0 in five years for half from now. This is how we want to make sure that we can integrate all the presentations made into a single platform that is called Dishes that will make AI deliverable. So I'm going to start with this image and ask you, probably some of you have already seen it, but I want to ask you to try and guess how many margaritas were sold the day after this picture was taken. You don't have to answer, just think about the answer. Now, as it was uh, I mean, the subject of this conversation, AI in medicine has been used in many, many areas, except probably for one area until very recent. And this is for conception and all decisions that happened before conception. We all know how big our fertility is as a problem. We know that 16% of couples in the world have fertility problems. And I know that a number won't tell our people much, but if you ask around you, sometimes people won't express and won't tell about their fertility problems. But if you look around you, chances are you all know people close to you that have infertility problems. And of course the challenge is, how are we going to make sure that we can deliver the service and provide top quality care to these many patients. For us, the problem is global and we need to join forces to tackle the problem. And through AI, bridge the gap between the current practice and the future IVF lab, which might be automated. IVF is a series of steps that require decision-making. This is from when the patient crosses the door and speaks to the doctor, we need to reach a diagnosis, and this is a clinical decision. Based on this, we decide the best treatment, the best protocol, the best time to trigger. And of course, in the lab, we need to choose the best sperm, select the order in which we, we're going to transfer embryos. But of course, we don't have the computing power that computers do, and we forget details. We forget about the quality and the information that we retrieved with about the egg, about the sperm. And then it's very difficult to account for this information when we need to make a decision, let's say about which is the embryo that we want to transfer. What we have been working uh, with IVF 2.0 is to make sure that the AI that we build is deliverable to clinics in such a way that you don't have to buy extra uh, hardware or upfront costs, which at the end, become a barrier for adoption 
and then and end up increasing the costs for patients. As it's been already presented, we started uh, developing our Ember Ranking Intelligent Classification Assistant, Erika, and very quickly realized that to take advice from anyone, whether it's an individual or a computer, you need to trust this advice. And having some background understanding on how these decisions happen make this a more or less trusted advice. And of course, we understand that embryos don't come, are not generated out of spontaneous generation. They come from sperm, egg, and we started very early making uh, some research around sperm AI and egg AI. We've been talking about this for the past uh, few uh, presentations, but of course we realize as well that it's very difficult for clinics to get one interface for egg, one interface for sperm, a different interface for embryos, and jump from one to, to the next one. More important is not only about the integration, the visual integration or the interface integration, but also not to lose information about the cells that are generating these embryos. And that's how we came up with the idea of dishes. Just because everything happens under a dish, that's why we decided to name it dishes. And this is a platform that we are uh, using now to integrate and deploy the AIs that you've been talking about. The plan started uh, early 2022. This was the goal, again, integration. And this is pretty much how Dishes looks today. The way in which Dishes is uh, set, split is based on days. So day zero is egg retrieval. And the intention is that on the one platform, we would be able to evaluate eggs. And this could happen at different stages. We could evaluate eggs after the elevation, or we can evaluate the eggs just before the injection. And of course, it's very easy. We have the egg under the invert inverted microscope. We have already selected the sperm, so we can extract the information, valuable information that could later be integrated into Erika's decision. You know, seed that is our sperm identification based on computer vision that tracks every individual sperm under the vision field, gives information for the embryologist to make a decision on the options that you have for, for the sperm. And, and we have Erica. Again, many publications that we've been working on and thank you all for all your support and, and on collaboration. We expect to publish many more papers alongside you. And in brief, what we want to do with our AIs and in particular with dishes is to change the way in which we're making decisions. So forget about making estimations on which one you think is the best embryo, which one is the best sperm, but working with probabilities. This is changing quantitative assessment for qualitative evaluations. And this should allow us to reduce variability, improve outcomes, and scale the process. And again, this is about integrating everything. And I'll come back to the example. If you have an embryo right now, or a set of embryos, and you need to make a decision about which embryo you want to transfer, the question, of course, is, do I remember the quality of the sperm and egg that made this embryo? And what if you didn't perform that ICSI? Is the quality of the annotations good enough for you to make a decision on whether embryo A or embryo B are the best ones to be transferred? So this is what we want to do. And on your side is making up your mind about adopting the AIs, digitizing and working, helping your, your clinics to get into the digital world. So all the valuable information about the stimulation, the number of eggs, becomes the big data that is going to drive the decisions and the recommendations that computers will give you in the future. In a meeting, uh, the AI meeting that was organized uh, around fertility in, in October last year, it was one common uh, narrative. The objective from now on should be integration. And this means either integrating AIs and interfaces 
such as the integration that we're working on with the issues. AI, as you know, is a tool, a very powerful tool. And if we use it right, it's not only going to help us improve outcomes, I believe that it could become a very powerful tool to generate knowledge. And of course, as IVF 2.0, we're planning for the next version of Dishes, Seed, Etica, and we need your input, we need your feedback, because at the end, we're working for you. Of course, we want to improve results for our patients, but you are the users of these tools. And jumping into this project early is going to allow you to have a say and influence how these AIs are going to develop and how well, uh, how good uh, of assistance they make. I like this phrase very much. There is no avant-garde, only people who arrive late. Or in other words, and I don't remember the quote who said it, but the future is already here. It's only not evenly distributed. And thank you very much for being early adopters, for joining us in these uh, early stages of, of the journey and for helping your patients. And going back to the first image that I put, again, how many margaritas were sold the day after this picture was taken? Your guess is as good as mine or as good as the computer's because there is no context. Now, with the power of big data, with the power of data and information, once that the computer has seen many, many images, probably millions of images, the computer will be able to understand that this picture was taken at a Mexican resort during the spring holidays of 2022, and that there were 2,000 margaritas sold the day after this picture was taken. The idea is that we can bring the individual embryo selection with the information that is coming from a few features even if extracted by AI, with the context that surrounds the decision-making process. And this context means, again, the feature extracted from the egg, from the sperm, the culture process, and what happens with the simulation, triggering, and the integration of all this information. How can we do this? With collaboration, with assistance from clinics like yours, and working together to develop this new future. Of course, the future is beyond uh, the AI and it's also, you need to integrate and improve uh, the interface, how we communicate with you, how can we remove the screen if possible, or at least a microscope that is pretty much in between the images and the decision-making process with the assistance of the computer. We believe that if, do th if we do things right, Selection is not enough. We need to influence the destiny of the cells that we're handling. We know that eggs is a bottleneck in IVF. And I believe that there will be a way with the help and assistance of AI to identify when is the best time to inject an egg, the best time to perform a transfer, attempt fertilization, beautification, and biopsy, if biopsy is needed in the future. So I want to thank the team of IVF 2.0, which now is, is a larger team, and to welcome any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Alejandro, for this uh, great presentation. A lot of philosophy behind this. Um, Getting some questions here. One one that is maybe maybe requires a little bit of explanation. One question that came in is uh, uh, why why would you look at uh, euploidy and not uh, other outcome parameters such as pregnancy rate or live birth? The further away we we get from the moment of fertilization, the more variables that kick into the process. So. Imagine we have exactly the same egg and sperm, but these are culture in lab A or lab B. Of course, 
there is individual, different individuals handling these cells. There are different environments, and we know that not all labs were created equal. Let's say that we have a euploid fantastic embryo with great potential to achieve a pregnancy. We know that 20% of implantation potential is well beyond the responsibility of the embryo. This is who is a doctor performing the embryo transfer, and not all doctors have the same uh, pregnancy rates, right? How about the environment in which this embryo is going to be transferred? How about the implantation window? How about if there is such a thing, uh, and I believe that there is uh, influence of the microbioma? What about anatomy problems? Do you know, I mean, does, do the, does the computer have the context to predict whether this patient, where the embryo is going to be transferred, has a high risk for hypertension during pregnancy, diabetes associated to pregnancy? We don't know if the patient is going to have a car crash. So how can we try to predict whether this embryo is going to make a baby? Again, the further away you get to the moment of fertilization, the more variables that we are beyond our control. Even if we don't like it, right now, I believe that the closest that we have to a gold standard is PGTA outcomes. Tomorrow, there will be an, a new and better uh, ground truth a new closest to golden standard, but today we believe that that's the closest that we are. Uh, I like to bring in Adolfo. Uh, um, Adolfo, the, this platform, this interface where you can house these different AIs called Dish S, or Dishes for short. How, how easy is that to uh, to use for for the average embryologist? Because you know embryologists aren't any, not all that different from from everybody else out there, for professionals in general, we, we don't really naturally take up the manual first and read the manual completely before we use the, <laughs> before we use the, an app. So does it compare to a regular app? Thanks, Jax, for your question. Um, actually, yes, it's super, it's as as it has been designed. It is it is it is made to be very intuitive. It is uh, made uh, uh, with the thinking or with a train of thought that we want embryologists to make their life easier. They are very, very busy. I mean, I'm, I'm not an embryologist myself, but when I've been there, they are running, they are rushing, they are, uh, uh, and and dishes might help them actually to to avoid all of these uh, uh, messy uh, uh, things that may that they might they might be involved in. Also, as Alejandro said in his in his uh, uh, presentation, having a platform where you can integrate multiple assistants, uh, where you can actually, for example, assess an embryo from not just from the embryo from, or, or from the blastocyst itself, but also from the single sperm that it was assessed or for from the single uh, uh, oocyte that it comes with. So integrating all of the, all of the path, all of the data uh, uh, from single patient, it, it might actually enrich the decision-making from, from the clinical embryologists. Thank you, thank you for that explanation. I, um, I think uh, we should open the discussion now for all the, all the lectures we've had and, and for the team that's here, uh, so Andrew and, uh, Gerardo, um, if you if you like to pitch in, uh, and we'll go ahead. Sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, a couple of questions for Debbie, if that's okay. Um, did you see any difference in the actual time to do the ICSI between uh, using SID or not using SID? Did you notice that, whether it was faster, slower, or the same? Um, yeah, well, we are, um, we, we've just started to use SID. So at the very beginning, it was like, it took us more time to do the ICSI with seed uh, rather than doing it traditionally because we had to like to play with seed. We don't, we didn't really know how to immobilize the sperm and so on. But once we got the habit with seed, it went much better. But we didn't, we didn't have a chance to quantify the time, um, so we don't have real objective values. But my feeling is that we, well, we it doesn't take much more time using seed than traditional ICSI. And I guess some embryologists will take more time to select the sperm for ICSI anyway than another embryologist, and you've just got that variability anyway. Exactly, yeah. 
And then another question was that, did you use a microfluidic tube uh, chamber during the study? We, yes, we did. We did. Uh, well, actually, that's the the we proposed the microfluid chamber for all sperm selection for all patients. So it was used for all sperm preps uh, that were included in uh, in this study. And actually, that was a part of the discussion because we we've discussed that with um with um with the IVF um, 2.0 team and one of the hypotheses why we didn't see a difference. Uh, in terms of fertilization rates, it's probably because we use the microfluidic chamber, which is a very, very good tool to select the sperm. So it's like using seed on very selected sperm. So it gives seed less chance to better select the sperm. That was that was one of the points that we've discussed all together. And, and then did, did you say which type of microfluidic chamber you used? Zymot. OK, all right, thank you. Another uh, last question for me. Uh, fertilization rates seem quite high in your study generally. Um, do you use XE across the board or do you select you know, male factor, non-male factor? What's your sort of split of it, IVF XE in your lab? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is the, this is North America. Uh, we use XE for a lot of patients for at least, I'd say 90% of our cycles. So they all go for XE. That's the reason why the fertilization rates are so, uh, the fertilization rate are so high. And and I didn't uh, give the precision, I think, in my talk, but we didn't really had uh, like an exclusion, um, exclusion, um, let's say, uh, we didn't exclude all the male factors. It was just like, uh, like a quantitative exclusion. We wanted to have like 10, 10 to 20 sperm in the field so that we can make sure that uh, we would have a sperm selection with seed. So, well, we didn't exclude any um, extreme cycles in terms of sperm counts, as long as we had the, um, the numbers that we had, we were expected to have in the field to do the sperm selection. Well, I guess the research question is, you know, if you're taking, you know, non-male factor and male factor XC, is there a, is there a difference between? Wait, I, I didn't do the exercise, actually. Yeah, but no. could, yeah, this is a very interesting point to look at. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Debbie. Oh, uh, thank you very much. So uh, we have some questions for uh, Alessia. So um, somebody is asking, how does Eric and Sid uh, fit into your daily work? Um, was it, it what it's like to be in a test lab? Okay, so um, Eric and Sid are actually um, very used in the laboratory. We use them all the time. If there's a transference, we use Erica. And there, if it's an ICSI, well, we use Sid. So yeah, it's it's um an old time um we use all the time Eric and Sid and any oh sorry. sorry. And so, uh, uh what's yeah. oh, sorry and what's no we go ahead. And on what's like being a test lab? Well uh first a lot of job <laughs> but uh it's really fun. I actually like it. We are always uh waiting to see what's next and what are we going to try to make better uh, the work we already do. So it's fine. <laughs> so uh, would you say that you are now so used to uh, use this technology? So um, I, I mean, what happened if uh, you don't have it? Will you miss it? Yeah, I will. <laughs> I will <Okay>. miss it. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, we have another uh, comment here. Um, it says that the double sperm selection pickup, it, it's, they, they say it's interesting, but there's a concern that maybe it will be a sperm sample. And uh, seed uh, will not have that limit, uh, you know, like because it ha has the ability to analyze all the sperms in the uh, spermatozoan field at the same time. Have you considered increasing the sperm concentration on the PVP droplets? Um, um... We, ha we hadn't considered it because for us, it's uh, better to choose like the 20 to 30 sperms and put it in the PVP because in that way, the sperms don't get like, um, I don't know how to say it, like they cross their paths. And when you're watching the seed, it is very difficult if you have many um, sperms to follow with those one. I don't know if that's clear. Okay, so so I guess the, the thing is once a thick leg, like once you 
go back to the ocular to see here if yeah. you have less than if you have yeah. many, right? Because you are immobilizing, you see the recommendation of seed and then you go to the ocular. And then you go back, to, exactly. Okay. So it's better right. for us to have less sperms for it's easier to, to track them. So, so I guess uh, <laughs> one of the things is uh, getting used to, to the immobilization and looking at the screen, right? Like Looking at the screen, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we have more questions. Uh, Jacques, have you got a question there that jumps out at you? <laughs> um, There's quite I, a few. There's quite a few. Yeah. Looking track here. Okay. Uh, the, this uh, in Manchester fertility. Uh, this would this would be a question probably for Alaska as well. Manchester fertility. Uh, that they have apparently seen a trend to less miscarriage um, after using SID. Um, so has the, has the, have you looked at the pregnancy rates in, at New Hope? Um, we haven't because uh, the sample is uh, very short. So we don't have like that much of amount of patients that have used SID and transfer them. So like say if it's significantly uh, higher or lower. So, no, we haven't. Um, and so, but you have pregnant patients from SID, right? From, from yeah. Music. Yeah, we do, but they are um, not a, a large patients. Small. Still. Yeah, we, yeah, we estimate that there must be about 100 ongoing pregnancies with the use of SID. So, okay. yeah, we still need to follow up, but we presume that we should have some results about uh, miscarriage rates by summer. Right, right, great. Well, Charles, anything, anything else? Well, I was going to say, and there's a, there's a, there's a question here by um, Saeed Khan, who asks about the actual timing of the ICSI. Now, um, you know, speaking to people, I think that it's a little bit different looking at a screen rather than the optics. But we know that um, there are some embryologists which take a lot of time choosing the sperm, a lot of people um, doing it quickly. So really opening it up to... Um, Aleska and, and Debbie, um, have you measured the amount of time which is saved perhaps by, by using SID? And then and the same question really goes out to Erica. A lot of time is, is spent um, trying to choose a blastocyst for transfer. Have, has anyone looked at the time saving in this at all? Um, I, haven't, I haven't measured it, but I remember that at first without Erica, for example, uh, if the patient had like, I don't know, more than two embryos, I, I could go like 10 minutes analyzing each embryo <laughs> to see which one it was the better to, to transfer. But now with Erika, I don't know, it takes like two minutes, maybe tops. <laughs> so, and, yeah. do you often, uh, and do you sometimes, you know, ask for another, you know, embryologist, would you say, what do you think? Do you do that at all or not? Yeah, we do. We are two here. Uh, we are two embryologists, and we're always like, what do you think? What do you think? And then we check Erica to see if we kind of agree or if we totally disagree. <laughs> Perfect. And how about Debbie? As I said, we didn't really, re we didn't really record the time, but um, I know that the junior, they complain a lot more about the timing, but I, my own feeling is that I do things faster with Sid. It's like, now that I use seed, I really rely on it and that I just choose the sperm that um, seed uh, points out. So to me, at some point, it will help us to save time, but I've, I've no record on that. It's just a feeling. Yeah, and, and um, how quick was it for you to adapt to, you know, like looking on a screen? It was quicker for the senior embryologist, for sure. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was, I, just a, a week to just to yeah just a, I think it took us a week to be to have the habit of using seed and to immobilize the sperm using the screen and even um to uh try and um you know when you put your needle down uh I I think that I don't really look at the the in the oculus only for the injection for sure but I do everything with this, the screen and it took us like a week to get used to it Okay, brilliant. 
there was a question about pregnancy and miscarriage for Debbie as well, but I guess at the moment the numbers are a bit too small. Yeah, they are was, too small. I was involved in a, a chair the debate on, on PGTA or no PGTA on, yeah. on Monday, and, and actually, unless your research question has the primary endpoint of miscarriage or time to pregnancy, it's then lower down on the sort of pecking order if you're going to go for live birth rates. And there are very, very stu few studies that have specifically looked at time to pregnancy. When we did look at Erica and miscarriage and, and so on, there was a trend towards it, but not to reach the statistical significance. And therefore, you needed more numbers to reach the, the main power, really. But really, you need studies dedicated where the primary endpoint is miscarriage and, and, uh, and uh, time to pregnancy rather than live birth rate. There was also a, a question about different sperm prep methods, again, for our embryologists. So did sperm perform differently with different sperm prep methods? And has that been looked at, I guess? This is one point we were really interested in looking at. But the problem we have in our lab is that we um, offer the microfluidic chamber to all the patients in all the cycles. It's like including in a, in a packet deal. And I'm, I don't feel comfortable to take a step back and asking them not to do the microfluidic chamber for uh, research purposes. But it's, it's frustrating, actually. I really like to know what happens if we use another sperm prep uh, method. Okay, Pretty much, uh, the idea is, and, and this is one of the key elements of presenting ranking systems. So if you have a very good sample and you put it, let's say, under 7% PVP, or the same sample, you put it under 10% PVP, of course, the speed, the line of speed, at least, of, of the spoon will change, but this change in the culture uh, preparation will be the same for the cohort of sperm. So by presenting a ranking, it will give you the best ranked sperm for injection. So when it comes to these microfluidic preparations, uh, I completely agree with you, Debbie, once that is standard protocol, then it gets complicated to justify a change unless you are uh, performing a clinical trial. Now, for other clinics that use these as an add-on, it would be very easy to, to do even more when you consider costs, because the current, uh, currently available microfluidic devices are relatively expensive. So you, if you are using this as an add-on and you are increasing the cost of your treatment, then it would be just natural. Okay, one patient that chooses uh, microfluids would, would be tested against the use of, of AI. And I believe that, I mean, and even if you are proficient at using uh, the current microfluidic chambers, it's very time consuming. I mean, many steps, you, things can go wrong very easily. In my mind, I might be wrong, but in my mind, there is no room for embryo selection. You can prioritize the order in which you're going to transfer embryos, but you have so few embryos that you don't really choose. Same with eggs, you're still going to fertilize all of them. The one chance that you have to select and influence is when you select a sperm. So if you have a million sperm and you bring down the sample to five sperm, then is that really giving you uh, an idea of the sample, the quality of the sample? Are you really giving the AI or the embryologist a chance to, to select the best sperm from one sample? So we've been working on that and, and changing the interface, improving the way in which we're presenting seed uh, seed scores to the embryologist. So hopefully everyone like you, Debbie, will get used to, to the screen very fast. And in this way, they will be able to put more, a uh, higher concentration of sperm in the sample. And I, I get you, Aleska, it's very difficult when you have many sperm, mm -hmm. but uh, again, we're working to improve that as well. And a question maybe for Michelle, how long does it take to onboard or validate an Erica set up for each clinic, would you say? So the validation of Erica, it's pretty, it, it's, it's pretty easy. And we, obviously Erica has to learn the specifications of the clinic because there's a lot of variation in lab settings and embryo images. So just by having the clinic upload 50 embryo images with PGT results or, or with other type of eye outcome, we can update the results. 
I mean, we can update uh, or assign a model for it to perform in the clinic. And um, uh, this could vary, but we do have clinics that really want to use Erica and they've uploaded the database within one day. And we've been able to run quality assurance process in 24 hours. So you could say quickly in two days, you could have Erica ready to set up and help you clinically in your lab. Well, th there are many uh, questions here. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the questions for the Mexican experience, it seems that the double uh, selection for the sperm pickup, uh, they say it's interesting, but it looks the sperm sample. Um, this is interesting because, uh, you know, normally embryologists will have uh, the, their attention of the human is limited. So uh, even if they try very hard, it's going to be difficult to be able to be aware of how all the sperm, like let's say more than 20 sperm the screen move. So it will be very difficult to assess which one is the one that has the better properties. Um, so that's a technique that I have seen some, some, uh, in some places. Uh, but actually that's something that seed can avoid. You know, like seed, the computer is able to analyze all the sperm. It doesn't matter how many there are. Even you can have a, I don't know, 40, 50 uh, sperms in the same uh, field of view, and SID will be able to track individually each one of the sperms at the same time and make sure that uh, it selects the, 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 best, uh, the sperm with the best uh, characteristics. So this kind of techniques uh, is not really necessary to use. I mean, it's up to you. If you want to use it, it's okay because, you know, you, you, you like doing it that way. But actually, if you're using SID, you don't need to, to do those kind of things that sometimes might add some extra steps to the procedure. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think these are good points. And I, I like to add that, uh, you know, um, um, I, you, you don't really know which one, which one of the sperms, or even if they move nicely and say the same, this is the one. Of course, you don't, you don't really know which sperm, sperm will make the ultimate blastocyst. Um, the, the thought is that a lot of spermatozoa can fertilize. Uh, it, it, it could be as many of the motor sperm, as many as 80, 90 percent. But the question is, what motility corresponds with good fertilization and blastus development and ultimately pregnancy? And so the more spermatozoa you have on the screen, the better your chances are when you have a selection tool like an AI like SID. Uh, however, and biologists humans have difficulties following wriggling things and keeping track of everybody so that that's why naturally any of you actually there have been three or four videos that were taken during these presentations of SID and you could see the embryologists presenting that present kind of diluted samples and and that's because it's easy to follow three four five sperm but not 50. so here you have an opportunity do that first but i think if you use it, go slowly to a more dense sample because you will increase your chances of having a better selection. Now, I think I think that makes sense. It's intuitive, uh, but it is not something we would normally do. We, we, we have difficulties tracking so many sperm to zone at the same time. So here you have an opportunity to change the protocol, but you don't have to do that from day one. You could do that, do that at your leisure once you once you're used to used to the interface. And a, a question from the from James in the UK for the panel. How do you manage sperm at different depths within the dish media? Something that you know we've discussed in the past. So normally what happened is that uh, SIT, uh, the, the computer vision algorithms from SIT will identify uh, the things that are move within the field of view. And then uh, it will uh, start tracking and make sure that that thing that moves is a sperm. Um, sometimes these sperms can go up or down from the current uh, focus plane, focal plane. Um, when that happens, sometimes we can still, it can still track them. Uh, but so, 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 you know, if they go too far up or too far down, uh, if you cannot see it as a human, the computer will not be able to see it as well. You know, it's, if it's too blurry and it doesn't really look like sperm, so you know it's not possible. But anyways, even that that's, that should not be a problem because anyway you cannot get. Uh, it's going to be difficult for you to get that sperm anyway if, if it goes, uh, you know, in different focal plane. So um, 
I mean, I, I think that uh, will uh, answer the question. Yeah, and it's the same for you know for you know, for someone doing you know doing the ICSI themselves, like an embryologist. You know, they haven't got the you know the time really to you know multiply focus on the sperm. They will see what they see in front of them as well, won't they? Um, question for Emmanuel. Um, you've been involved with installing dishes in certain clinics around the world. So is there a sort of optimal clinic um, technology wise or what, what does a clinic need to be able to run dishes and sit as an optimally? OK, um, I understand if I understood well, do you want to know which is the optimal setup? Yeah, to have our technologies. OK, sure. So. Um, lastly, we have made some improvements around seed. So do, do you, don't really, you don't really need a super powerful computer anymore. You can have like a medium hardware computer. It should work okay. As well about the cameras, a smaller resolution as you can, you, you have is, is better for the algorithms as well. When you evaluate in terms of how they move, you don't really need a lot of resolution. But we are bringing in morphology. So if you want to be able to evaluate morphology, you need a, a really good camera to, to be able to do so. About the microscopes, any inverted microscope should work with SID. I know certain clinics work with 20x magnification, other ones with 40x magnification. So those should be the like the standard ones. And um, if you have any other software laser or something like that that doesn't allow you to use the camera in both places we also made a lot of improvements in a way that now we can use any camera in in the market so in terms of morphology a really good camera about resolution should be great otherwise you can use any camera okay thanks uh, a question for omar would do you think it's possible to combine looking at the oocytes and the sperm to help choose um, the better embryo? I think that, that we can go there. Yeah, it's possible because what, what we are talking about is integrating features about two elements that combine them will result in a outcome that we already know we can uh, maybe track. Yeah, if we have the possibility to say, okay, we have to look this and then we this we want this outcome. It's possible to build an AI that can help us with that. But the the main problem would be, okay, how to avoid our bias of learning to to help the AI to learn something else that we are not looking at this moment. But it's something that we can manage. It's something that we have to work on. And maybe in a year or a couple of years, we have this AI that would choose. The, the, the specific uh, sperm and egg, and then CG says, okay, they would be the better embryo. And then it's something I've heard in lectures and, and conferences. What about the acoustics of the fluid around the sperm? Are you, are you looking at the sound that the sperm moving within fluid can make? Uh, okay, at this moment, we, 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 we don't are taking account that. Uh, the main problem is that we need to maybe use another technology and other mathematical stuff to to transform the the acoustic or the the feel around the the, the sperm that will complex uh the analyzing that we are doing at this moment now maybe we can think about it and see what what, what can go there maybe uh, a question for Ma maria land for for the uh, about the the Canadian experience. Uh, a, a question that came up is: Have you looked at the pregnancy and miscarriage rate after SIT? Do you have enough data? Um, right. So no, we have not correlated um, our blastocyst um, outcome using SID with pregnancy rates yet. Um, but this would be very interesting to do so, and needs to be done. Yeah. Um, so for you and as well as, as uh, um, the Malaysian experience, the fertilization rates seem quite high in your study. Um, do, you, do you apply, I presume you apply ICSI to uh, non-male factor cases. Um, 
would you consider looking at the results in male male factor and non male factor cases as two distinct groups? Mm. Um, because because there is some you know there is some feeling out there that exhibits non male factor is five to ten percent higher. So maybe your data is affected by that distribution. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, no, we didn't group our um, we didn't group our our, our results in that way. Um, but as you mentioned, that would be a really interesting analysis to do um, and could be easily done as well with the data that we have using SID. Yeah. yeah. Is this something now that you do routinely using SID or is it still piecemeal and, and you're, you're careful or, or no, are you right using now, it routinely? Right now it's still under um, our research and development uh, section of the clinic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a question, yeah, yeah, Jack. Um, the piezo exe. Do you think that's the future? Will we all, will all clinics be using that, or or is it still very much selected few older eggs, or is it still experimental, or is it is it accepted and adopted? Uh, well, I think I think so. There's a lot of experience with piezo in the mouse since since 25 years already. Uh, when you use mechanical piercing of the mouse or lemma, the mouse membrane, it actually it actually will as a, as a like an 80 or 90 percent chance of dying. So in the mouse you have to use piezo and that experience is very good, very good results. There are, there are, there are an increasing number of papers, maybe Giles can comment on that as well, but I think there are an increasing number of papers uh, following piezo uh, in, in the human. I think Michelle is pretty uh, um, um, I, I, I think the Malay, Malaysian lab is pretty confident that that's the way forward. Um, and they seem to be using that routinely. I, I think there are other ways you could use a laser. There's literature on that as well. Uh, it's not widespread using a laser to take the needles through the zona pellucida. So again, so you don't get that, that indentation and you go gently in the membrane after that. Um, but it has been tried for, for almost 20 years. So sporadically, maybe 10, 12 papers. Um, with Piazzo, it's probably not more papers than that. So people are careful and uh, waiting for each other's experiences and talking to each other about that, uh, which is kind of normal. It's a big step to take. In the case of Piazzo, it's extra equipment. In the case of, uh, of, of uh, using a laser to pierce little holes in the zona to make the sperm microneedle goes through, they, that, that equipment you likely already have. And so that would not an, as, uh, an extra investment, which is, which is what we are in IVF 2.0 are aiming for. We don't want to have extra hardware unless it's really needed, or unless we really have proof that, that, that it is beneficial. Uh, it's a software-driven uh, um, uh, software system. Um, uh, that's where the solutions are. So, so yeah, Piazzo, uh, I don't know why we're, we're not trying it out. Maybe Manchester, uh, maybe Liverpool, this could be a, a good occasion, uh, may, maybe in, in Montreal. It's, it's, I, it's I would gathering, say try it out. I mean, it's gathering, you know, like a lot of interest now, you know, although it's been around for a long time, um, there's a few companies that are obviously following it, you know, very closely. Um, and again, it slowly seeping into Europe, I think, and there's a lot of interest, but of course, it's got to be tried and and tested. But just a little plug for an upcoming webinar, which is next Tuesday um, on the uh, on the 14th of March, is there's, there's going to be a talk by Prof Deirdre Zander Fox, and she's got some very interesting data on that. So again, if anyone is interested in hearing more about Piezo in the, in the clinical uh, aspect, then that, that's a that's a talk not to miss, I think. Do you think um, maybe for uh, for Debbie, do you think Sid could help with uh, with labs that are sort of struggling with their ICSI KPIs? As all these labs <clears throat> that we've heard from different parts of the world seem to have good fertilization rates. So do you think it's, there's an opportunity for shared best, better practice, whether it be best practice or not? Yes, probably. Yeah, I think that. Um... Seed will help in that sense. Um, we we haven't reached that point for us, but yes, I think it it would be a, a nice input in the lab. Okay, great. 
I think I think that Omar has been very quiet. So we have. I think to leave the last the last question, perhaps to him. But you talked about you know the features and and finding out the features for that. But do you think it's possible to use the features that we have from Sid, and features which we could have, for example, from you know some kind of egg evaluation, to then select downstream, which would of course be the embryos for transfer. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's something that is coming up. We we have the ability to to evaluate what's that, as as Alejandro told, how to choose the, the suitable sperm. But we have the ability to rank the suitable oocyte and then try to see what is the perfect combination to have uh, maybe a good embryo transfer before even doing the procedure. We 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 I, we think we are in a process when we are going to infer the, the result of the outcome from C technology and to see if Erika can be a ranking, but of embryo that are going to, are still not fertilized, but they are already estimated. Okay, thanks. Um, I think it's about time to wrap up this, this little short webinar by us, but I'll leave you with the words of Al Maravilla, who puts it quite, nicely in the sense that it's, a, it's exciting times for the field. So I'd like to thank you all for your time and effort to be here. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that took part in the webinar, everyone that took their time to actually watch us. Okay, you're the early adopters. And as um, Alejandro said, we need you to, you know, to take this further. We need to know what you want. We need to know your experience. I'd like to thank the support for I3 as well. And of course, the continuing work which RVF 2.0 is doing. To our speakers, Debbie Monjean from Fertilis and Adele Lim, Alpha IVF, and Aleska Valadez and Dante Sanchez, who will join us for the next session, or who is in the New Hope Mexico Clinic. Of course, Omar Paradez, and of course, the one and only Dr. Alejandro Chavez Badiola. So, again, thank you all. Thank you, the moderators as well. And we do have um a second session of this people have missed this session or find it more convenient there is another one at 6 p.m eastern and it's on the 8th of march so again i hope you'll join us there if you'd like to lead us out michelle thank you so much for joining us we appreciate Lee deeply for all of your trust and joining us in the special webinar i hope you have enjoyed the session we and um, about the top tips that you have learned from the embryologist using our technologies and hopefully these tips that can help you in your everyday practice. We want to stay close to you, so tell us uh, if you have your regional meetings and ways in which we can connect to more people in this beautiful community that we have. And please feel free to reach out in case you guys have any suggestion, comments, or ideas to either uh, support at ibf.com, ibf20.com, Michelle, and Shell's email as well, which are shown in the screen. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye.